I come at the form body material that I'll share with you tonight as a poet and essayist with a background in medical humanities. If the uncanny juxtaposition I've arranged for you, uh, if these just juxtapositions are meant to ring neither definitively nor authoritatively, but conjecturally and imaginatively, that's the effect of my having been instructed by a doctor the pioneering otolaryngologist, instrument designer and inventor, the pulmonologist, woodworker, medical illustrator, the pediatrician before such a specialty existed, the writer, Chevalier Jackson. The reading I've curated for you had its origins in the year 2006-07. It was a year for me of strange and terrifying discovery. In 2006, when I stumbled upon a collection of objects that people had swallowed or inhaled in Philadelphia's anatomical museum, the Mütter Museum, I was initially struck by the strange nature of these things. The question of why someone would gather them together in one place, and the poetry of their arrangement in a disquieting set of drawers. It wasn't until I discovered that the doctor who extracted them, a man with the peculiar name of Chevalier Quixote Jackson, he lived from 1865 until 1958, it wasn't until I had discovered that he had written a best-selling autobiography in 1938 that I realized there was a book waiting to be written about the collection. There was, after all, something literary at its center. In the teens, 20s, and 30s, readers of newspapers across the country were riveted by tales of heroic rescue performed by Jackson, and in particular, his unerring retrieval of foreign bodies stuck in the upper torso. Jackson dedicated himself to making his fellow practitioners and the larger lay public foreign body conscious. All that a button asks in the foreign body exhibit is that one follow one's interest in it. And if one does, to arrive at the multiform perils and pleasures the collection represents and incites. One discovers, if one dwells long enough, for example, that there is no such thing as a foreign body, but various orders of such. There are phantom foreign bodies, multiple foreign bodies, voluntary swallows of non-nutritive things, and forced. There is the allure of errant foreign bodies and the special charge of message-laden foreign bodies. And finally, there is the art the doctors who remove them make from them in order to tame what they cannot understand. That some of the things, unlike human bodies, are imperishable and insoluble. I said at the outset that the year 2006-07 was one of strange and terrifying discovery for me. It was the year I stumbled upon the foreign body collection, but in the midst of that, I also found quite by accident a different kind of foreign body in my chest, a tumor in my breast that turned out to be cancerous and that had apparently eluded mammography for years while it silently morphed and grew. By placing excerpts from two very different books that emerged from those discoveries called Back and Swallow Side by Side tonight, it's my hope that you'll hear an interarticulation of errancy, a kind of errancy with spokes. Let me just say now that the program includes the art of the great photographer and natural historian Rosamond Purcell, whose light-filled images of the foreign body collection constitute most of the foreign body slides that you will see tonight. The swallowing plates made by Bay Area artist uh, Lisa Wood, whose assemblages incorporate tintype era photographs alongside imagined foreign bodies. And Albert G. Richards' stereofloral radiographs, the first experience of which I had soon after my cancer diagnosis in David Wilson's magnificent Museum of Jurassic Technology in Los Angeles. I also wanted to note that though Thomas Aikens might seem like the more obvious artistic analog to Chevalier Jackson's work in oils, in fact, Jackson studied with a colleague of Aikens, I treat Jackson's non-narrative assemblages as a form of abstract art that is more in common with the work of his near contemporary and fellow ascetic, the collagist and box maker, Joseph Cornell. 
Last but not least, I thought before starting, I should also note that since, see, I haven't started yet, that since gay marriage in Rhode Island only became possible last year, the wedding ring as a form body might have a different resonance today than it did at the time when I wrote the piece with which I will close tonight's reading.